Man critically injured by police in Prince Albert. A Mi'kmaq woman dies in provincial custody in Nova Scotia. Toronto Police Superintendent charged with drunk driving, and it looks like he was served alcohol at a special police headquarters bar. PEI had its election last night, and U.S. Immigration Police are accessing records at elementary schools and abortion clinics through a legal loophole. Good morning. It's Tuesday, April 4th. I'm Nora, and here are your headlines. We'll start this morning in Saskatchewan. Prince Albert police have put a man into critical condition. Early Saturday morning, police stopped a black car that PA now reports was connected to, quote, a stolen vehicle investigation, unquote. The article says that, quote, at some point during the interaction, unquote, police tasered the 40 year old man. After tasering him, they arrested him. Then he went into medical distress and he remains in hospital in serious condition. The article seems to be solely sourced from the PA police service, which is hilariously abbreviated to PAPS. The province's serious incident response team is investigating. Back in January, the Paps shot and killed a 34-year-old man. By February 3rd, the only information that had been reported by police related to the incident was that an Indigenous liaison had been appointed for the investigation, suggesting that the individual who had been killed by police was Indigenous. But there didn't seem to be any further official news from them. But the victim's family spoke out. They spoke to the Saskatoon Star Phoenix and identified the victim as John Gardner, a member of Canoe Lake First Nation. The family said that at the time, the only news they were receiving about what happened came through the media, reminding again how important it is that journalists don't simply rely on the official police line when reporting on police shootings. Now to Burnside, Nova Scotia, where at the east unit of the Central Nova Scotia Correctional Facility, which is a provincial prison, Sarah Rose Denny died. She was 36 and had been hospitalized for pneumonia. Denny was from Eskasoni First Nation. She had two children and was part of the Eskasoni Women's Drum Group and the Denny Family Dancers, reports the Halifax Examiner. A missed meeting with a probation officer is what landed Denny in custody. The province didn't release details related to Denny's custody, but Shirley Tuplin, her close friend and relative, said that she might have been there maybe a few weeks. What was supposed to be a short, bureaucratic thing turned into delays and difficulties, and Denny had to stay put. Tuplin said, quote, we can't just walk into a walk-in clinic when we're in correctional. It's their responsibility to make sure they give the proper care to the people that are in your care, unquote. The official line from the Department of Justice was that Denny died from, quote unquote, natural causes. Tuplin said that she contracted double pneumonia and it reached her heart. Emma Halpern from the Elizabeth Fry Society, who knew Denny, said that a lack of medical care is the number one complaint that they hear from incarcerated folks. And just a note about how well written this story is. Zane Woodford does an excellent job finding folks who knew and loved Denny, and the feature is so much better as a result. So if you're a journalist and you're wondering, how can I report better on deaths in provincial custody or deaths by police? Take a look at this piece or also the piece in the Star Phoenix about John Gardner. They're both very wonderfully written features about horrible tragedies. Next to Toronto, where a Toronto police officer, Superintendent Riaz Hussain, got loaded back in October, tried to drive from Toronto to Pickering along the 401 and crashed his car into a delivery truck. In January, he was charged with impaired driving. Now, cops are charged with impaired driving all the time. It actually happened just recently. Someone I used to know, a cop, was charged with it. But what makes this story special is that Hussein may have gotten loaded at police headquarters in their own fully licensed bar. The article by Nicole Brockbank at CBC News is extremely careful to not allege that he was drinking in this police bar and then got drunk and then drove home. It just says that Hussein had been in the bar, which is called the Executive Officer's Lounge. Brockbank writes that it is, quote, unclear whether or not he drank in the room. CBC has reported this as if no one had heard of this police bar before. On Twitter, the Toronto Star's David Ryder pointed out that over the years, the cop bar had been mentioned in various articles. How did the CBC establish that Hussein was in the bar? Well, 
When you enter the bar, you need to scan a security pass. Through a Freedom of Information request, the record that they obtained showed that Hussein scanned his pass to enter the lounge at 4.31 in the afternoon. You don't have to tap out to leave, so there's no further information related to the bar. And, of course, we know that by 7.39 that evening, he had already been assessed by paramedics and had already crashed into a delivery truck. Now, it isn't all that weird that there's a licensed space at Toronto Police Headquarters. When I was a student at Toronto Metropolitan University, there were several rooms that had or had previously had liquor licenses that made zero sense. But they were thanks to licenses having been attained over the years because you do need to have a license to hold events and stuff. So I personally don't find it that strange, though the CBC did some digging and found out that in police land, It is strange. The RCMP is the only other police agency in the province to maintain liquor licenses. They have liquor licenses at locations in London and Ottawa. Anyway, Hussein will be before the tribunal on a misconduct charge, but his license has already been suspended and he was fined when he pled guilty to charges against him earlier this year. The article doesn't mention how the delivery truck driver is doing. Next to the littlest provincial election that could. That's right, PEI had an election last night and the Progressive Conservatives took a handy win. They won 22 seats of the 27 seats available. The Liberals won three seats and with that are the official opposition, while the Greens dropped to two MLAs and lost official party status. Because in PEI, it takes at least three to party. Before the election started, the PCs had 15 seats, so jumping to 22 was a major victory for them. Voter turnout was record low, just 68.5%. And I know that in most parts of Canada, that would be considered a very high voter turnout. But the province typically has had 80% voter turnout because, well, when it's possible to know half the province, voting just feels different. The loss of the Greens is particularly bitter. They had gone into this election with eight seats, the largest ever Green Caucus in Canada, and they had been the official opposition. Now, the Liberals, well, the leader, she lost her seat and their caucus shrank from four seats to three. The NDP was shut out again from winning a seat. And finally, to the United States, Wired has an investigation into just how deep ICE is snooping into data from schools and abortion clinics and many, many other agencies. Recall that ICE is the American Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency. The feature by Dhruv Marhota reports that ICE is using, quote, an obscure legal tool to demand data from elementary schools, news organizations and an abortion clinic, unquote. The tool is called a 1509 Customs Summons. Normally, they're used in criminal investigations about illegal imports or unpaid duties. It was used more than 170,000 times between 2016 and August 2022. Marota reports, quote, the primary recipients of 1509s include telecommunications companies, major tech firms, money transfer services, airlines, and even utility companies. But he goes on to say that there were other groups, the ones that are far more concerning, like a youth soccer league, surveillance from an Illinois abortion provider, student records at an elementary school in Georgia, health records at a state university, three boards of elections and data from a religious organization that provides refugees with supports. And and this is wild, at least twice to pressure news organizations to reveal information about their sources. There's no judicial oversight for these summonses. The article quotes people who suggest that this is illegal and an overreach, and also anonymous agents who say that it's possible that these groups were legitimately surveyed because the mandate for ICE is so broad. But it is curious that even for the vast majority of the summonses, what kind of summonses would be sought from telecommunications companies who make up half of the more than 172,000 summonses, or the 15,000 summonses put to Google, Meta, or Microsoft. And aside, never write a story that uses the word summonses so many times. <laughs> this is not easy, folks. I encourage you to read the article. It mentions all the ways that Marotra tried to find out from these groups about why they had received a summons. Like from the abortion group in Illinois, they were told, quote, ICE had demanded surveillance video of a man running through their parking lot for a financial investigation. Okay, then. 
Anyway, it's concerning. It's very well reported. And who knows, maybe there are some lessons in there for Canada. Those are your headlines for Tuesday, April 4th. I'm Nora. And folks, it is Sandy and Nora Day. So in a couple of hours, listen up, new episode drops. And I got to say this episode, it's pretty funny. We laugh through the whole thing. So if you're feeling down about federal politics and you want to hear someone make fun of the federal budget for 52 minutes, we got your back.